So I'm going to invite each of us to just kind of close our eyes and smell the tea before even tasting it. And uh, does anyone want to share what, what you smell? Does it remind you of anything or bring up anything for you? Some kind of root. Ah, good guess. It's related to root in your childhood memory. Root beer. Right. Yes. Thank you. Oh my God, I'm yeah. This is, this is one of the plants that is used in traditional root beer, right? So this is, this is birch. It's a native tree and, and plant that has this um, flavor and set of medicinal compounds in the bark of the tree. And it's also it's used along with sassafras, another native plant here, and something called sarsaparilla, which is yet another plant. And those three together are kind of the, the trio that make up the traditional root beers, which is Actually, each of those plants is a medicinal plant. Sarsaparilla was traded to China and, and then to, the, to Britain by the barge load back in the 1700s and 1800s because people were under the misunderstanding that it treated tuberculosis, which it doesn't. <laughs> but it does have a lot of other medicinal properties. And so that's actually a major trade item of the Southeast US was sarsaparilla being dug up and sent off to other continents. Um, so then it got turned into sugary sweet root beer, which has very little to none of these active constituents. That's a really interesting little piece there because it shows how there are so many common medicinal foods, that's what we're talking about this evening, right? Food as medicine that have been a part of culture and a part of cuisines throughout the world. And then those things have often gotten kind of tamed down or commercialized out of medicinal applications and into just kind of a commodity. So this is birch. Um, and also birch, some of, some of you might have been, might be familiar with something called xylitol. You know there's xylitol, right? People use it in neti pots a lot to rinse out the na nasal cavities. Xylitol is naturally derived from birch bark as well. So it's a sweet tasting substance, but it doesn't metabolize like sugar and it's antimicrobial. Um, but one of the major medicinal applications of birch is as in reducing inflammation, right? So inflammation, we start talk talking with our integrative and holistic healthcare practitioners, they'll tell us that inflammation is, is related to most, if not all, of the common diseases in our society, right? When you, when you have uh, especially systemic inflammation, then that sets the conditions for a weakened immune system, for susceptibility to cancers, um, and for all kinds of allergic disorders. Those come from a state of inflammation in the body. And a lot of the modern lifestyle that we live and the environmental conditions that we're in the middle of and the high stress levels create inflammation in our bodies. So we need to systematically address those things, but also a part of a lot of traditional medicinal food tr um, cuisines has to do with reducing inflammation. And you get into, in many different cultures, different continents, hundreds of different plants that all work to reduce inflammation in the body. And then that sets the condition for all kinds of systemic healing. So birch is one of those. It's one that I'll drink whenever I have the time to make birch tea to harvest it and process it. And this is actually from a birch tree that I cut down with some teenagers out at Earth Haven Eco Village, which is where I live. And um, so they harvested this to, we were actually making fire kits for making um, bow drill fires, you know, where you make a fire with friction. And one of them harvested a birch tree that ended up being too big for that. So I took it home and made medicine and that's what this is from. Um, and it also has honey in it, this drink does, right? Honey, not just a sweetener, but honey is, a, is one of the 10 most important ingredients in an herbal first aid kit. Um, and you find this, for instance, maybe some of you heard that that's a major ingredient in the embalming of mummies in Egypt, right? Was honey, because honey is a is a preservative because it has antimicrobial compounds in it that, that work against bacteria, viruses, fungi that would work to decompose things. And the bees put it in there to preserve the honey against those same things, right? They, it comes out of their 
gut um, microbiome. It creates these compounds that prevent things from breaking down so they can store honey for a long time in the hive. The same things that are used to embalm uh, mummies, but it also serves that effect when you treat a wound on your skin with it. Right? So if you, if you have, it needs to be true raw honey because cooking honey breaks down those compounds and breaks down the enzymes that are part of that action. So raw honey, I keep that in my little satchel of about 20 different kind of herbal first aid components. And um, if there's ever a kind of a minor to mid-grade wound, honey is one, of the, is one of the first things that goes on there. And you can even embed it with herb powders like from yarrow or cayenne. And those herbs work along with the honey to stop the blood flow and to um, not to sterilize the wound, but to create a different microbiome on the wound. I'll go ahead and bring in the concept of, of microbiome. I'm just going to jump in here and go deep because so microbiome. Anyone here know what microbiome is? What is it? Right, that's right, and a collection of organ of creatures, organisms specifically, and so two people, you two, if you each got a cut on your left foot sitting here right now, one of you might get a staph infection, and one of you might not. And staph bacteria are present ubiquitously through the air. Surely some of them are settling onto both of your wounds. Why does one of you get a staph infection and the other one doesn't? It's mainly what's called the microbiome, which means that there are other bacteria living on the surface of your skin that create a whole ecosystem. If you zoom into it, it looks like a forest, really, or like a coral reef under an ocean. It's a whole community of thousands of species of organisms living on your skin, and many of them are working with your body to create health. So if, if one of you has a healthy microbiome that's actually on the surface of your skin defending against staphylococcus, is it staphylococcus? Yeah, I think it was like streptococcus, staph, staph turning into an intense infection, keeping the population from exploding. The other one of you doesn't have a microbiome like that, and so the staph takes off as an infection. So that's, instead of sterilizing things, a part of kind of, the, a, a part of the emergent holistic healing picture that we're starting to see is that if we can establish healthy microbiome, and this extends from the skin to the gut and all over, and I'll talk in a bit about how that ties in beyond the human body to farming methods too, um, that microbiome is the real kind of um, picture of how we can create health rather than just trying to fight down enemies, the microbes we don't want. We create a whole ecosystem that keeps all of them in balance. So honey is part of that, that's in here. Of course, it doesn't have that function when it gets heated in this drink like that. And then kudzu root powder. Who here has seen kudzu, the plant kudzu? Yeah, okay, it's, this, it's a, a vine that lives um, in the southeast U.S. They're, it's really common. There are about 7 million acres of kudzu growing in the southeast U.S., 7 or 8 million, depending on who you talk to. And um, it's a plant from southeast Asia that was brought from Japan over to the U.S., um, especially starting in the 1920s, to plant on steep slopes that were eroding from people logging, clear-cut logging, farming on steep slopes, building giant roads and cutting through mountains to do that. We created all these steep eroding hillsides where all the soil was washing away. And then everyone said, uh-oh. And so we were trying to figure out how to prevent more erosion from happening. And um, one of the things that happened is, well, one of the things that happened is that the Civilian Conservation Corps got created by the federal government, which is an incredible organization that we need to recreate now that employed hundreds of thousands of people across the U.S. to perform ecological restoration. Well, they didn't call it that then, but that's what it was. It was all kinds of stuff to restore soil and damaged farmland. We need something like that now for climate change. But that's one thing they did. Another thing they did was they brought in kudzu, because kudzu grows very fast. It's a fast-growing vine that covers the soil so it prevents rain from hitting the soil directly and washing the soil away. And it has um, this property of, of what's called nitrogen fixation. That's a, something in, in plants where nitrogen is the main nutrient that plants need to grow. It's present all through the air around us. It's over 70% of the air that we're breathing. But only a few plants can pull that nitrogen out of the air into the soil. 
in order to provide plant nutrients. Those are called nitrogen fixers, those plants. Most of them in the world are in the bean family. So beans and peas and kudzu and thousands of other plants in that plant family fix nitrogen. So what that does is it improves soil. A nitrogen fixing plant improves the soil to allow other plants to then grow there over time. That's the kind of ecological role that it plays. So they brought kudzu over for that reason. And the thing is, they didn't bring over the culture of people using it. See, what happened is that in, if you go visit Japan, even now, kudzu patches there are like ginseng patches are here. They're passed down from generation to generation with harvesting rights because a single kudzu root can, be, can grow to be 500 pounds and 200 years old, right? They're these incredible old growth beings full of food and medicine, which I'll talk more about in a second. And so the, there's no issue of the plant getting overgrown there because people are harvesting it. But when it got brought over here um, and used for the single function of erosion prevention, the culture of use didn't get brought with it. And I'm going to talk more about this kind of culture of use because it ties kind of ecology and human health um, and farming all together, right? The culture of use is this commonality that you'll find around the world with indigenous land-based people. It's a, it's, a, it's a whole complex of recipes and stories and tradition um, and medicinal knowledge and ecosystem management that revolve around a given plant. And there are cultures of uses in, dig in indigenous America around corn, around sugarcane, around tobacco, um, and, and around kudzu, there was and is in Southeast Asia and Japan, where the plant is from. But the thing is, the plant got brought, no culture of use got brought, so people here weren't harvesting it from the very beginning, and kudzu exploded. It's the fastest growing vine of any vine that grows in temperate regions in the world. People call it foot a day vine, because sometimes they say it'll grow a foot a day, which I haven't measured that. That's a pretty fast gr claim. I'm not sure about that, but. It definitely grows very fast, covers up buildings, right? Covers up trees sometimes and starves them out for sun and kills them. Covers up farmland, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing about kudzu is that every part of the plant is, is useful and there are economies around, there's a whole cottage industry scale economy around every part of the plant um, in Southeast Asia and Japan, right? The vine has this fiber in it, this beautiful golden fiber that's mixed with silk to make kimonos. It's a tr traditional thing kimonos are made out of J in Japan. The leaves are a higher quality fodder for animals than alfalfa is, higher protein than alfalfa. And the root has a starch in it that you process out that's kind of like um, potato starch or arrowroot starch, if any of y'all have used that in cooking, except that it has medicinal properties to it that are different than those. And I have some with me. I'm going to pass it around in a moment. Questions before we keep barreling on? So this white powder <laughs> is, is kudzu root starch that we made um, every winter. And you're welcome to take a little bit and sample it. It's very neutral, very flavorless. Um, it, uh, so we have an event each winter in Silva, North Carolina. It's about an hour from here. It's where I grew up at my dad's property um, where we, we have a class and a, and a whole four-day event and dig up kudzu roots and process the starch out. Um, and then the starch is used, for instance, in this. Um, you might, if you feel it kind of with your mouth as you're tasting it, this drink has a slightly thick feeling to it. It's because of the kudzu root starch. And if you added more and more, it would get to be even thicker until it's like a cream. Or if you added more, it would be like a gel. And so there's a whole cuisine in Japan, hundreds of dishes that are made based on kudzu root starch. Um, but here's the thing, most starches in the world um, are acidifying in, in the body when you eat them, but kudzu root starch and millet are, to my knowledge, the only two starchy foods that are alkalinizing. The Western diet especially, and this is kind of a big picture, not going to go deep into it, but is an acidifying diet, what we call an acidifying diet. What that actually means is it, the Western diet has a lot of foods that make it hard for our, our bodies to maintain a neutral pH in the blood. And so the body has to work really hard 
to maintain a neutral pH in the blood. Because if, if your pH in your blood strays a little bit off of 7.1, you die, right? So if, it, if that's threatened by eating foods that are acidifying, like coffee, alcohol, lots of meat, lots of most carbohydrates, um, eating too much of those things, the body has to keep the blood neutral. How does it do that? It pulls minerals out of your bones and teeth and makes them soluble and puts them in the blood to neutralize the, that acidic action. Over time, if you do that, that's mining calcium and magnesium and phosphorus and potassium from your bones, and then you're pissing it out. And so over time, acidic diets are part of what is leading to loss of bone and tooth health, right? So kudzu has minerals in it that help your body to alkalinize. So it's, it's reversing that process, or at least preventing that process. And going along with that, it also has this effect of blood sugar regulation. So if you eat kudzu root starch with a sweet food that contains sugar, like the honey in this tea, it causes your body to digest and release that sugar more slowly. So instead of this peak blood sugar and then a dive, you have a more even keeled release of sugar from your digestion into your blood. So rather than this kind of peak trough that a lot of us are familiar with from like caffeine and being stressed out all the time, it helps with this even distribution of energy. So all of that in this kudzu that is called the worst invasive plant in the US by a lot of government agencies and so on and so forth. And what we're saying, we have this organization around this called the Kudzu Cooperative, and we're trying to kind of educate and develop a culture of use around it again. We're saying, no, the problem isn't the plant. The problem is that people aren't harvesting it and using it. And so at my dad's, where we've been harvesting for eight years now, there was kudzu all up in the trees, right? But now we've harvested all the roots from those plants and there's no kudzu growing in the trees. It's that simple, right? Humans harvesting in the right way can affect the kind of ecological outcome. And just to kind of tell one more story around that, so I grew up on this land in Silva, and um, in my whole childhood, I used to get really bad canker sores. Any of y'all get canker sores? Like, right? Especially if I bite my lip or tongue or cheek, and they were so painful. Like, I used to stay home from school sometimes from them because they were so painful. I couldn't talk, and it hurt to eat or drink or breathe. Um, and so there I was uh, living in the middle of this four acre patch of kudzu for my whole childhood, getting these awful canker sores. Fast forward 20 years, I started doing this kudzu work and harvesting kudzu root starch each winter, and having an abundant supply of it. And I got one of these canker sores one time and I, I, had, just, I just had this intuition that said, make a little slurry of the starch and swish it in your mouth. And I did, and it has this soothing kind of slippery alkaline feeling to it, right? And so normally those canker sores take about two weeks to heal and they're super painful. This one went away in three days. This is eight years ago. Now whenever I get one, I immediately do that. So I grew up in the middle of this three acre patch of the medicinal plant that would have been addressing the exact problem I was having. <laughs> and so that's really fascinating to me. And, uh, and this old plant, plant teacher of mine, Frank Cook, who passed away a number of years ago, he used to say, um, wherever you are in the world, whatever plants you need to heal you are within a one-day walk of where you are. And with that, with that one, it was like a 30-second walk. But, you know, so the, it was, it's just amazing to notice how when there's not a culture that passes down the knowledge of how to heal, we can be living right in the middle of healing partners and not have any knowledge of that, right? So again, culture, and that's a lot about what food as medicine is about. It's kind of a different conception of medicine um, where medicine isn't, you know, and this, you all are probably all familiar with this kind of net of ideas, but where medicine isn't just a targeted um, laser beam on a problem but rather medicine is seen as a holistic support system for human health, where we still sometimes use the Western medicine approaches in emergencies and in you know, crisis situations. That's what Western medicine is especially good at dealing with is crisis situations. 
but we want to prevent ourselves from getting to those crisis levels by holistically managing for health. And that's a whole system thing that has to do with life choices that we make and people we surround ourselves with and the types of community that we live in and, um, and certainly how we sleep and how we eat um, and how we drink water and how we exercise. And, right, all those things contribute together towards whole wellness. So food as medicine is a really deep and big um, building block for that in a lot of traditional cultures. How do we eat? in a way that we're thinking of that food as medicine, as part of the thing that's keeping us healthy, so that we don't have to deal with crisis as often. Um, any kind of comments or questions before we go on from there? You look jazzed. I am. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, we have so much healing power, you know, from the different things. I can get the healing power from that. Oh, yeah. You know? Well, or even like when you, you said, like, the leaves are good fodder for animals. Yeah. So are they edible for humans? They are. Yeah. Yeah. Just really quickly on that, um, what I do is harvest them in the midsummer mm -hmm. before they get all woody and kind of chewed up by bugs. Mm -hmm. And then I dry them and powder them. And it makes this dark green powder that's very strongly flavored and it's, it's high in protein, it's like 22% protein, right? Um, so I've used it in smoothies and stuff a little bit, but my favorite way actually was in tamale dough. It's yeah. a masa for making tamales, if any of y'all have ever done that. Mm -hmm. And I put in a couple of tablespoons um, in like a four cup batch of masa dough and it created this dark kind of green speckle appearance and this really amazing rich flavor to the dough. And so I think that's, that's the best way to use it for human food. The kudzu leaf is as a small fraction, but potent fraction in stews or doughs or things like that. There are people who are making protein leaf concentrate and it, from kudzu and then making a tofu from that protein leaf concentrate. So that's a whole other direction you can go with it. Yeah, so if any of y'all want to learn more about kudzu, I'll send out, send around a little sign up sheet at, towards the end of our time together and you can write that interest on there. And we have a kudzu root camp in the winter where we do the root harvesting and processing and go deep into all of this different preparing foods and so on and then and then digging kudzu roots and that whole kind of thing. Um, and then kudzu vine camp in the summer when we harvest the vines for fiber and we're learning to make cloth out of kudzu vine fibers, beautiful golden fiber and, um, and foods out of the leaves and so on. Yeah. Um, so then to go to a different story here, uh, we were talking about the microbiome a little while ago. And um, so I was at this really fascinating conference a couple years ago called the, the Spirit of Sustainable Agriculture. And it was, it was actually up at the Harvard Divinity School in Boston. And it was all these people from around the world who are working at the intersection point of spirituality and sustainable agriculture. Um, and there was this man there from Nepal who um, is like, a, he's a native Nepalese guy who grew up farming and now he works as an agricultural consultant there and a researcher. And, and his question he got interested in is how do the ritual farming practices of these people in Nepal, um, how are they scientifically verif verifiable to have any type of effect? And they had this amazing ritual farming cycle, you know, where like, every two weeks during the whole year um, they had different ceremonies and community events related to what they were doing in the fields or the forests or the hearths processing food at that time of year and um, then there was this one that he talked about where this moment when they were getting ready to plant millet and they grow millet mainly for making beer actually they make a, a millet beer um, and they all make together and then they all drink together you know in another ceremony <laughs> but uh so they make this millet, they grow this millet for mainly for beer, and when they get ready to plant the millet, they, um, they come along and make the furrows with a, like a um, ox-drawn plow, and then they drizzle, come behind those furrows, and they drizzle raw milk in the furrows of the soil, and they say that that's an offering to the soil. And then they come and plant the millet behind that. And, um, so he did test plots 
and did one test plot, you know, with milk drizzled and one without. And then he studied the, the microbiology of what was going on. And what he found was, was that this one with the drizzled raw milk, right? What is raw milk full of? Anyone know from a microbial perspective? Like think about yogurt. Definitely enzymes, but what's that? Lactobacillus, right? So lactobacillus are, as you'll see, that's along with bifidus, I think, or yeah, one of the genus, the groups of bacteria, beneficial bacteria, like I was talking about earlier, that fight strep, right, that are in yogurt. Well, the reason it's in yogurt, now it's introduced in factories, but the reason it originally is is because it's naturally found in milk, right? So by drizzling that milk on the surface of the soil, they were actually inoculating the soil with lactobacillus, which was then present when the millet seeds germinated. And he found on the millet seeds that were planted in the milk drizzled fields, they had these really high levels of lactobacillus on the surface of the plant. And then those millet plants that grew up in the milk drizzled fields have the lactobacillus living on their skin, just like we do, because when plants get infected by pathogens, right, because plants have a whole world of disease and pathogens just like we do, the pathogens land on the plant and they enter through the stomata, which are the tiny little microscopic holes that are like the breathing holes of the plant. The pathogens land on those and penetrate the plant through the stomata. Well, these millet plants had lactobacillus. The lactobacillus was a bodyguard that was protecting the stomata and creating an immune system for the plant. Then the people were taking that millet that grew up after it grew into seed heads, taking the, the millet seeds, malting them, which means you germinate them and then roast them. So they deliberately kept some of those seeds aside without roasting them, which would kill the bacteria, and mixed those in to inoculate their beer, which they then drink all the beer together, inoculating themselves, right? And lactobacillus, of course, if you buy, uh, if you buy a, um, uh, what's it called? Supplement, uh, what, what's that? Pro probiotic supplement um, at the store, at the health food store, one of the main, the first ingredient probably is gonna be lactobacillus, right? So that's important in digestive ecology, it's important in our skin ecology, it's important in vaginal ecology. It's, it's a protector of all of those systems in our bodies. They're drinking this beer full of lactobacillus, then they're going and milking the cows to get the milk, re-inoculating the cow udders with lactobacillus, taking that milk, drizzling it back on the soil, and the cycle continues. So he documented this microbiome process that was being carried out by this traditional people with no scientific microbiological knowledge um, mediated by their ritual farming cycle and showed how the, the, the wisdom of that had a direct verifiable microbiome kind of dimension to it anyway, right? So that's a, this is a whole other realm of food as medicine, right? And, and that's kind of the, the perspective I'm coming from. Um, you know, I, I come from a, mainly like a permaculture perspective, which who here is familiar with permaculture at all? A little, little bit, yeah. So, so permaculture is, um, it's a really, it's a big collection of ideas and different people define it different ways and that's fine. Uh, but the, one of the definitions that I use is that it's a design system for creating regenerative human habitats. And it actually comes from uh, back in the 70s in Australia these two um, researchers, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, uh, who are kind of ethnobotanists who were studying indigenous people and their land-based life ways. Um, but then they were looking at Australia around them and seeing the practice of agriculture in Australia was destroying the landscape of Australia because they were killing all of these steep slopes with giant tractors which what happens when you kill a steep slope with a giant tractor, any guesses? Yeah, massive erosion, right? You open up the soil, then there's a torrential rainstorm and it washes all the soil away. And in Australia, they're already dealing with not great topsoil. So then they're destroying their little bit of good topsoil. And these two researchers, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, they said, wow, I wonder if there are examples of 
um, people and places where people have lived for in one place for hundreds of years without destroying the place that they're living in. <laughs> and, uh, and they conducted a research project basically based on that. And they found that yes, there are hundreds or thousands of indigenous people who've been living in one place for a long time without destroying it. And they found some commonalities between all those people. Um, they found that they tended to rely more on tree crops um, and perennial crops and less on annual crops like um, soybeans and wheat. They, they, they found they tended to rely on small animals rather than large animals. Um, and then they found that a bunch of commonalities in how people kind of manage water in their landscapes and also that they organized around village scale agriculture, right? Not large scale agriculture with machines, but village scale where people the same people are growing the food, preparing the food, serving the food, eating the food, all doing that together, right? Because like we just spoke about in Nepal a moment ago, how would you have a microbiome cycle like that that's contributing to human health if that was being done on an industrial scale, right? There would be no way of replicating that cycle of food, cows, soil, ritual without that being done on a village scale, right? So these researchers found that there's commonalities and they developed this thing that they called permaculture, which was their, them saying, is there a way that we can go to any place on the planet and develop a human ecosystem that is truly sustainable, or if we use this word regenerative. Regenerative is kind of like beyond sustainable. It's saying it's not just something that we can sustain the same thing year after year, but something that's better for future generations than it is now, which is a lot different from what we're doing now in our general earth management where we're leaving a bunch of giant messes for future generations, right? There are people, all of our ancestors, who had an ethic of leaving pleasant surprises for future generations instead of a bunch of messes. So that's a great concept and, and a hard thing to imagine too, you know, when you're born into a situation where everybody is just leaving us a bunch of messes it's hard to even have the imagination or the willpower to say what would it look like to live in a way that's leaving pleasant surprises for, for future generations. But in fact, we have done that. And permaculture is an attempt to say there's a design approach to look at any landscape or building or city or region and follow these kind of design principles and come up with a whole uh, life way or a habitat that actually is regenerative, that's providing for a long-term healthy ecosystem and healthy people within it. So permaculture is, is a way of systematically doing that, consistently doing that, or at least that's the theory. Um, and so, so that's kind of my, my work has been working as a per permaculture educator and consultant, helping people who own land or starting different community projects to develop visions like that and, and the details as well. Um, and I live at a place called um, Earth Haven Eco Village, which is a it's like a 330-acre um, intentional community and experiment in this same kind of stuff. It's, it's going into its 25th year. So it's um, had some successes and some failures, you know. But it's a great place to come and learn if any of y'all ever want to come take tours or we have classes and stuff out there at earthhaven.org. Um, yeah, so permaculture at its best is, um, is working at this level. It's not just an agricultural design system. It's not just how do we farm or how do we plant edible plants in a city. And it's not just a human health thing. It's not just how do we grow human health, right? And it's not just an ecological thing or just an economic thing. It says all of those things are related to each other. And if we actually want to have truly functional systems, we have to look at how all of those things work together as a whole system and then grow systems that are healthy in all those ways, right? So, and that takes, a, that takes a lot. It takes a lot to actually move in that direction, especially in a society that seems to have a lot of momentum going in different directions than that. Um, so any comments or questions before we go on to the next kind of story? I'm gonna bring it back home to here, um, so in the Southeast US. So, have any of y'all eaten hominy before? Hominy, yeah. So what is hominy? It's made from corn, right, exactly. 
but how do you make hominy out of corn? That's part of it, but you soak it with another thing. Yeah. So it's you soak it with wood ashes or lime. Uh, not the fruit lime, but the mineral lime dust, like what goes into cement baking. And what do both of those things have in common? Lime and ashes, they're alkaline, right? It's a theme, right? We were talking about alkalinity and acidity earlier. And they're alkaline because of the minerals that they have in them. That's what makes things alkaline or acidic, is, is the types of ions of minerals that they have in them. So lime is calcium hydroxide, right? So it's calcium that's making it um, uh, a basic or an alkaline substance. And then wood ashes have all kinds of other things. They have sodium, potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, as well as calcium. And those things, um, chemically speaking, are called salts, right? And they actually are salts. So the salt that we put on our food, sea salt or table salt, is mostly sodium chloride. But there are all these other salts. And this is actually a whole thing in a lot of, um, again, many different land-based people make a food called ash salt. They burn down specific plants, dried plants into ashes, and then use that like we use salt on food. But it's way healthier than salt, than the salt we use, because instead of just being sodium, it's all of those minerals together. So somehow the native people of the Americas discovered that if they cooked corn with ashes or lime, it changed the corn. And we've now got kind of a chemical explanation for what's going on, but they've been doing this for 7,000 years. And it's really important because, um, just to go a little more into the kind of the biochemistry of it, so niacin, have, does anyone know what niacin is? It's a B vitamin, right? And um, if, if, if a person has niacin deficiency, you get a disease called pellagra. Um, and this disease is, um, was actually a, a very common disease all through the south of the US up into the 1940s because there were all these mostly uh, white poor people who were eating corn without cooking it with ashes or lime. And why did that give the niacin deficiency? Well, it turns out corn has niacin. It has B, that B vitamin in it. But if you grind corn to make cornmeal dry and then make cornbread out of it, that niacin stays stuck to the protein in the corn and never is released. And you can eat corn all day long and never get enough niacin. And you'll develop pellagra. And pellagra is an, an awful disease. You have, it's a breakdown of your, uh, of your neurological system and digestion and you get weak and tired and eventually people die from it. Um, and so this was a, a chronic disease because again, the, the white people of European descent didn't take on the culture of use of the corn, right? You travel all through Mexico, all through Central America, South America, all the natives up here, the Cherokee, everybody, 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 whenever they cook corn, if it's a dent corn, which is, or a flint corn, which is a hard types of corn grown in the field, not like sweet corn, which is grown to eat tender, right? And it's always cooked with lime or ashes. And when you do it like that, it becomes a medicinal food that's, that it releases all those nutrients, it releases the B vitamins, the niacin, makes that available, and you can eat it. In fact, some of the Mayans are eating, eat corn as 80% of their diet, you know? major food source and it's it's a healthy food life-giving food as soon as you take that culture of use away and start eating a bunch of corn without that alcohol alkali treatment it becomes a poison right um, and so this is a theme right and then you go to sugarcane same thing with sugarcane sure you know look at sugar and diabetes in our culture now well sugarcane is a native plant to the americas it's been grown here for thousands of years people have cultivated it but we weren't growing vast monocrop plantations of it and then condensing down the sugar and then using chemicals to refine it to white sugar and then dumping it by the tablespoon into our food. It was, a, it was, a, it was a, an actual food used in an unrefined form and a balanced level in with other foods, right? Same thing with cotton. 
cotton is one of the most um, devastating culprits in the ecosystems of the South U.S. because of the amount of biocides used on, co on cotton. You know, if you were all wearing cotton clothing probably right now, cotton that is grown in traditional industrial farming is covered in insecticides, right, because of the cotton boll weevil. Right, the, the insect that assaults cotton, they, they just drench it in insecticides and it runs off into the rivers and percolates into the ground and takes decades to get broken down after that. Um, and then if you buy cottonseed meal or cottonseed oil, you're eating that stuff, right? Well, cotton in traditional Mayan farming is grown in what's called the milpa, which is the corn and beans and squash and other plants grown together. Cotton is grown as a shrub that lasts for many years inside that mixture of plants. And then they harvest it and spin it and make clothing out of it. They make food out of the seeds. They make medicine out of the roots of the cotton plant. Um, there's no poison going on with the cotton plant in traditional Mayan agriculture. It's part of an ecosystem of the milpa with the corn and the other plants. And it's part of an ecology of use also. They're harvesting it and using it on a village scale, right? So you start to see how these systems of um, ecologically healthy land management hang together with the systems of healthy human food because the same cultural mechanisms that pass down knowledge of how to farm in a way like that also pass down the knowledge of how to prepare food like that, right? And so in the same South U.S. where we forgot how to cook corn with ashes because we didn't listen to the natives who gave us the seeds. In that same south, we took the cotton out of there and took it out of its traditional usage and drenched it in poison. That's now poisoning our ecosystems and poisoning our bodies. It's that same forgetfulness that leads to the unraveling of the, of the agricultural ecosystem and of the human health system. See what I'm saying? Um, kind of questions or comments there before we go on. So can you still get the same nutritional benefits today if you, because I know you do mitre colony in a can, but you can also buy it dried. Yeah. So I, I, I've never eaten it. Yeah. I mean, except maybe I've had it you know, drip or whatever. Yeah. So does it, it still has that nutritional value then? If it's true hominy. Which, yeah, hominy in a can usually is. People sell things called hominy grits, yeah. which are not actually alkali treated. Okay. And by the way, and the old Aztec word for it is nish tamal, which is where the word tamali comes from, nish tamal. Um, and so that's the other ways. So hominy is the way it was done by the Cherokees around here, but in Mexico and Central America, if you get tamales or tortillas or any of all those foods that's made with masa, which true masa is not a powder flour, it's corn that's cooked as whole kernels with lime, then you rinse the lime off, and then you grind it wet in a hand crank grinder or whatever grinder, and it comes out as a dough. So you're not making a flour and then mixing it with water, it comes out as a dough. Um, and that's what I do at home, is I, I grow different types of corn like this and cook it with ashes, save the ashes from the wood stove in the winter, you know, and then um, cook it with ashes, rinse it, grind it make one batch of that a week and make tortillas, and that's kind of my bread. I don't eat gluten, and I don't make bread out of wheat. I just make tortillas or tamales, and it's a really wonderful way, and they're so delicious, too. I'm getting hungry talking about it. <laughs> do you sell it at businesses? Sometimes, yeah. I've done milpa farming classes where we do that style of farming called milpa, which is the mixture of corn and beans and squash and tobacco and cotton and amaranth and other plants, and then we cook during the class as part of it. So it's like learning how to farm that word learning how to cook that way. So yeah. the hand hominy is what they drain and still pull it back? Is that correct? Well, yeah, yeah. If it's, truly, if it's truly alkali treated, you can also... Can, it hasn't, right? Because it's already cooked. It should say, it, pro it almost certainly is, but um, I haven't looked at canned hominy in a long time, but it should say lime as one of the ingredients if it has that. And that's pork and pozole, right? Pozole and yeah, pozole is the word in the southwest U.S. Okay. for hominy. Absolutely, oh, yeah. Like that. Totally. <laughs> and you can also buy... Um, dent corns from different local farmers who are growing dent corn, and then you can cook that yourself with lime um, and or ashes. Where do you get lime? Uh, you can get it at uh, Ingalls. It's called pickling lime. Okay. Um, but it's food, it's food grade at that point. 
and, you, and it's cheap, and you use a tablespoon per cup of corn, so you're not using that much. Okay. Yeah. Um, make sure to rinse it and read up about how to do that, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, there's a great book called um, Milpa from Seed to Salsa <clears throat> that goes into this stuff some. Um, it's actually half in Spanish, too, which is really great. It's written about this one village in uh, southern Mexico in Oaxaca called Yuku Yoko, which uh, in their whole village scale cuisine and agricultural and cultural and ritual life around this. It's a really whole beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, and actually, if you're interested in that too, I'll mention another book called The Maya Forest Garden by a woman named um, Dr. Annabelle Ford, which is about the, in Guatemala and Belize, the, the native Mayan um, agricultural and cultural practice around all of this. Um, Pick pickling, people use it in pickling as well. Yeah, um, you can also buy tiny little packets of it at the tienda at the, at the Mexican food store, but it's way cheaper and the exact same stuff to get pickling lime. Um, I would recommend it with ashes though if you have a wood stove <coughs> and can start your wood stove. So what I do is I use corn husks to start the wood fire all the time, not paper, no whatever. So there's nasty stuff in there. So it's like really good clean ashes, and I save those and sift them and use that, and that just creates this amazing, smoky, complex flavor in the food. And if, you're, if you want to get in touch with me about any specific thing after this, um, you can just make a note of that here. And um, um, I got one more little story to tell here, and thing to taste. Uh, <clears throat> so this is um, an elderberry syrup in a reused tincture bottle. Um, so that's why it says something else on it. But uh, and I, I can share this recipe also if, if you if anyone wants my recipe for elderberry syrup. I call, I call it elderberry magic. This particular one because it's not just elderberries. But anyone here familiar with using elderberries for medicine? Yeah. What, what's it? What's the main use? Um, it's what if you're sick with a cold. Yeah. Yeah, a virus. a virus. Yeah. So, right. So, elderberries. Um, <clears throat> There's a whole other thing to tune into is, is the colors of foods <clears throat> are a big part of understanding the medicine of foods. And that's not a woo-woo thing. That's, that's a biochemical thing because the thing that makes foods colored are what are called bioflavonoids. They're compounds that the, that the plant creates to fight infections off itself and to preserve it, they're antioxidants, right? That's what antioxidants are about in plants, is preventing oxidation, preventing damage um, from bacteria, viruses, fungi, or environmental conditions. So purple plants, like elderberries, blueberries, mulberries, um, even beets, the thing that makes them purple is called anthocyanins. There's a type of bioflavonoid called anthocyanins. And, um, they are just different anthocyanins have different benefits, but the, the ones in elderberries are called proanthocyanidins, pro and they work by, so see the way a virus gets you is a virus comes into your body, it comes up to one of your cells, it injects its own DNA into your cell and tricks your cell into replicating the virus. The purple stuff in elderberries prevents viruses from binding to your cell walls to do that. And it does it more effectively than any of the pharmaceutical antiviral medications that the farm, farm companies have been spending billions of dollars to develop. There was this clinical trial in Israel, I think it was 2012. It was when the big H1N1 scare was happening. You all remember that? All around the world. And they did a clinical trial on, on H1N1 specifically in Israel and found that elderberry extract was better at preventing H1N1 spread than any of the pharmaceutical <laughs> antivirals. <laughs> and we can just grow it here. Um, and this is a great example of the visibility of the healing of um, the earth being in relation to the healing of people because uh, you know we have all kinds of crazy viral epidemics going and possible right now on the planet. But also in our area, we have a major ecological issue, which Tim knows a lot about because he's a hydrologist which is the deforestation of creeks and rivers. And a lot of creeks and rivers around here have been deforested. 
to um, make more farmland and more pasture land or to develop um, buildings and so on down there in the floodplain, which is a bad idea to begin with. Um, but what we have then is a, is a very, um, a very affected and diminished stream and river ecosystem because creeks and rivers need to have trees growing over them to shade them, to keep the water cool, to filter out the water when it rains, to provide habitat for fish and organisms, right? Creeks need forests in, in this bioregion. Elderberries are one of the fastest growing um, and most easily propagated native plants that grow in riparian areas along creek sides in this region. So this is one of a suite of plants, we in permaculture we call it a guild, a group of plants that grow together like corn beans and squash or other sets of plants that kind of support each other. Elderberry is one of a guild of plants that we can use to reforest creek sides and help bring creeks back into health and at the same time grow this medicine that's a very needed medicine in our time and place right now. Um, and so in this one, I put elderberries, I also put medicinal mushrooms. Um, it's a whole thing we didn't, we didn't have time to go into here, but just to give it a quick mention. Um, and there's a book, Mycelium Running, if any of you all want to learn more about it, that goes in a lot into medicinal mushrooms and using mushrooms to heal ecosystems as well. But this one has turkey tail mushrooms, maitake, something called maitake or hen of the wood, reishi mushroom, um, which is about the most researched medicinal mushroom on the planet that has all these anti-cancer compounds in it and fights viruses as well. Um, and cordyceps mushroom in it, um, along with raw honey and enough alcohol, organic green alcohol, to make it 25% alcohol. So that helps it preserve, because I, I usually make about three gallons of this at a time, and I don't want to keep it in the fridge, so right, alcohol lets it be preserved at room temperature. So this has enough alcohol to be sanitary, and I'm gonna pass this around if anyone cares to try a little bit. You're welcome to try some of my elderberry syrup. I'm gonna do it without touching it to the mouth, so it's like that. And you can grow it yourself, right? So you can plant these and they'll be, you can plant a little stick, literally. You take a cutting from an elderberry plant, like that big, stick it in the ground with no roots. It looks like a stick. It grows into a plant in the early spring and within two years, it'll be producing fruit. I have some in my backyard right now. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And there are, I don't know how it got there. Oh, yeah, because it's a native plant. And there are cultivated varieties that people have developed to have more of the medicine in them or to um, have bigger fruit and so on. But yeah, there are a lot of, of just wild native ones. So, it's, and that's it's tastier than Tamiflu as well, I dare say. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> Gonna help anyway, yeah. Definitely helps, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, fermented foods is the whole thing. I, I, I decided not to go into that here because it seems like more and more folks are teaching about that. And I was like, let me hit on some things that maybe aren't as widely known. But absolutely, I, I make lots of fermented foods and and eat them every day, and it's I think that's a huge part of health, yeah.
yeah. strong, yeah. you know, fighting whatever. Vital, yeah. Way. yeah. Yeah, and then just to emphasize it, with that, you know, say with sauerkraut, with the cabbage, cab not all cabbages are created equal. <laughs> and uh, the, the way that cabbages are grown, the way that the soil is full of nutrients or not, the microbiome that's present on the cabbage when you chop it up to get it fermenting, those things are all part of the medicine that is delivered to you. So like in Nepal, with the milk drizzled millet example, you know, encouraging us all to start thinking on that level and what little ways can we get involved in growing things ourselves and in that whole cycle. So that, um, because the food alone, we can only get so far with purchasing food grown in large scale settings that we're not connected with. True healing, in my opinion, involves us getting more involved with ecosystems, more involved with soil ourselves. Um, so that's kind of like a holistic picture of it, in, in my opinion. Yeah. It's a big part, yeah, it's, it's what I've been working on for a long time. I actually have a whole other project that I'm kind of working on right now, which is a bigger, a different thing, but, um, but yes, it's, it's, a, it's, it's how I live my life, and, and, and so I'm really uh, honored to come here and share about it a little bit, and we got to share more resources if you all get in touch with me, and yeah. Yeah, Living Systems Design, I, I should neglect to mention, my, my website is livingsystemsdesign.net, um, and um, and yeah, at earthhaven.org is the place I live where we do a lot of classes. And any other questions or comments before we? Is Delta really taxing to you stuff? Or is it just grow in the way that you don't have restrictions around? Yeah. No, I, I, I have planted it many times in drier places. It takes a little more watering to get it established. But then once it gets established, it's very vigorous and doesn't really care. Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't do well in, in like New Mexico, maybe. Actually, there are native elderberries in New Mexico. But it wouldn't do well on a dry mountainside in New Mexico, but it'll grow most anywhere here if you just water it to get it established. Yeah. And oh, by the way, and Useful Plants Nursery is an awesome nursery that's located at Earth Haven that sells a lot of these types of plants. I'm not involved in it. It's not, it's not selling it for myself, but they sell a lot of great plants, including some cultivars of elderberries. Yeah. The spotted wing fruit fly, yep. Some people have had some problems with the spotted, it's this it's, um, tropical, non-native uh, fruit fly that has migrated into our region in the last five years and it's given people problems with raspberries and blueberries. And I've had some problems with elderberries, but not as bad as on raspberries. But also, unlike with raspberries where you're gonna eat the berry, with elderberries you're just cooking it down to get the juice out. And so to, to me, it doesn't actually matter if there's some, some fruit fly larva in there. I'm still going to cook it down. Yeah, mildly. It's not like a, oh my god, it's going to kill me kind of thing. But um, so there's a certain processing technique. So it's like the elderberries come out in these big um, flat droops that look like an umbrella kind of. And <clears throat> they're on a single stem. And so I clip those off into a bag and then freeze them immediately on the stem and they get brittle, and then you can just take them in that bag and just slap them against a hard surface, and they all fall off the stem, as opposed to picking every berry off. Ariana's back there like, oh, oh yeah, I've done that. You can sit there for hours picking all these tiny berries off, and literally takes two minutes with this method, with the freezing method, so that, that really helps. And the way they used to do it before freezers was with a special comb that would comb the berries off the stem. Yeah. Yeah. That can be a significant issue in squirrels even, I've seen it, you know, but uh, bird netting, that's an issue. In which case then, it's worth designing your elderberry planting in a row rather than a patch or a long skinny row so you can have like a 20 or 40 or 60 foot long continuous section of netting with weights at the corners and throw that over the whole row and make it easy to access. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you all. It was really fun. I appreciate having you all. And, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. And there's plenty of more birch kudzu tea if anyone wants it.
get you ready for dinner. For tor- now we're all going to see each other at the Mexican restaurant, right? <laughs> if, if there was only an Ecuadorian restaurant.